So not only do you need a, right, a, plane, right, a horizontal plane for azimuth, but you also need a GP point for the sun, and it must be directly below the sun. It has to be. This is some official, officially made diagram. This is the way it has to be. This here is the GP point of the sun. That was Brian's logic trying to convince people that the Earth is flat by making the claim that the sun's GP has a place in this alt as diagram. So why is he wrong? Well, because we know where the sun is overhead at any given moment, he is essentially assigning that spot with non-coordinates. So what's stopping him from drawing in a map? Not explicitly shown here is the celestial sphere which has an infinite radius, and it effectively reduces the observer in the centre to a point. Therefore, there is no place on the reference plane that holds any meaning. You can't move about on it, and you certainly can't map it. So, in an effort to understand it a little better myself, I've had a go at constructing the geometry used in this coordinate system, and you'll notice that I've split the sky up into two halves. One hemisphere is visible, and the other cannot be seen. This point on the observer's meridian represents their zenith, and then there's this orange line which all objects on the sphere appear to rotate about. Where this line intersects the sphere, we'll find the north and south celestial poles. And these angles in red correspond to the observer's latitude from a globe Earth. With the horizon as a reference, the observer can describe the sun's position with altitude and azimuth coordinates, and I think this is a pretty cool way of visualising them. And on any given day, the sun will follow a path based on its declination value, which for simplicity, I have it fixed for the whole day. It is worth noting that the sun's declination will in fact be constantly changing as the Earth moves in its orbit, so the sun's path would be more of a tightly wound spiral than a circle. These points mark where the centre of the sun will be for sunrise and sunset, and there's a number of ways I can position these, but I've opted to go one math route and I've figured out their Cartesian coordinates with a little bit of trig. I'll take you through these formulas later in the video. When looking at lowercase a, the observer's latitude is the Greek letter phi, and delta is the declination of the sun. But there's also this value alpha, which is controlled from this slider, and it's currently set to 50 arc minutes. If I move this to zero, then the moment of sunrise has already come and gone, because that will place the centre of the sun on the horizon. So we might then think about lowering it by the semi-diameter value of 16 arc minutes, and this would then make sunrise the moment when the sun's upper limb first makes an appearance. But whether rising or setting, refraction at the horizon will cause the sun to appear more elevated than it actually is, by about 34 arc minutes. So we can also take that into account. This then makes the zenith distance 90 degrees 50 arc minutes for the points of sunrise and sunset. And this is the same as 90 degrees 50 arc minutes. We can also get a very accurate day length from this geometry by measuring the central angle between sunrise and solar noon. Dividing this angle by 15 degrees will give us half the total number of hours for the day, which we can then double for the complete day length. Or we can go the math route again. In this example we have a sun declination for London of 23.44 degrees, which means we're looking at the June solstice. We're showing 16 hours, 38 minutes and 18 seconds, which is only 4 seconds different to what Time and Day has on their website. All the other results seem to check out too. Just left of the table there is this plus and minus button, and clicking it will change the sign of these latitude and declination values, essentially reflecting the sun and the observer about the Earth's equator. You'll notice a certain symmetry here, and that only comes from the Earth being a globe. The sun's path doesn't appear to have changed at all, but everything else seems to be mirrored. So before I go through what I did to obtain each of the formulas used in this project, let's take a look at a few different cities. This was Punta Arenas, Chile in December 2024, where the Flat Earth contingent of the final experiment were making southern skyline observations. The YouTuber Geronism watched the sun set south of west, light up the sky to the south, and then rise a short while after south of east, all while the lit portion of the skyline was moving right to left. This was when it dawned on him, and I'm not just talking about the sun. 
He realised he was watching the sun out in space lighting up half the planet as the Earth was turning. The sun here is in the direction of the dark blue arrows. After the sun sets south of west, it's easy to see why they witnessed the lit skyline in the south as the lit portion of the sky wasn't actually that far away from their location. The brighter part of the skyline travelling right to left until the sun rose again, south of east, precisely as the globe model expected. Preset 27 is for Punta Arenas, and I've used Suncalp to look up the declination value for solar noon for the 12th. And this is the result. As you can see, the sun is travelling right to left as you face it, which for some of us northerners is a bit strange, but absolutely normal for those who live far enough south. From this view, you can imagine the TFE participants standing on the coastline looking south, and it makes perfect sense. Comparing with time and date, well, we're only 12 seconds out either side of solar noon in a day that lasted nearly 17 hours, so I'm going to take that. The other values are a match too. Those of us who followed the final experiment saw the sun circle the camp going right to left and never setting, not going higher than 34 degrees in the north or lower than 13 degrees to the south. And for the last one, I have to head over to Margate, South Africa, where Flatsoid made some Christmas morning sunrise observations. And basically, this is the path he saw the sun take. Every moment the sun's altitude and azimuth are predicted just by using his latitude on a sphere and the angular distance of the sun's position from the equator. And if we just stop it randomly here and check one more time with time and date, we can see that the sun coordinates are a match, along with all the other values. So let's take a look at how I arrived at these formulas and you can see I've stripped this down and added some useful points and segments. In this GeoGebra script, delta was for the sun declination, phi was for the observer's latitude on a globe and alpha was there to give us more accurate results. I started off with the obvious dimensions like the red angles corresponding to the observer's latitude and as this is a sphere centered on O, the white dotted segments have a length of 1 and the black segments, which are the radius of the declination path, have a length of cos delta. The green segment OA has a distance of sine delta, making point A the centre of the sun's declination path. The two small light pink segments OD and FB have a distance of sine alpha, which was 50 arc minutes in this project, although I've exaggerated that a little bit here so I could see it better. The variable lowercase a was used a few times when determining where to position the point of sunrise and sunset, along with acquiring their azimuths. Lowercase a refers to the distance of the orange segment, bd, or the sum of the red and blue segments, fc and co. Co was quite straightforward to work out using this right triangle, as too was fc in this one, although I elected to replace tan phi with a sine cosine ratio in order to have a common denominator. So that's what I've got for distance BD, and I've labelled that lowercase a. With the azimuth values, or angular distance from north, I was wanting angle BDS in this right triangle, but I needed side SD first. Side SD is pretty straightforward when looking at right triangle SOD. The hypotenuse is 1, the small pink side is sine alpha, so side SD can be nothing other than cos alpha. So now that I have two sides, BD and SD, I can have the azimuth values for both rise and set. For the XYZ coordinates of rise and set, well, I have Y and Z already and I'm just needing X. Y is the distance BD, which is the variable lowercase a, and Z is the distance negative sine alpha. For X, I wanted the last side of the right triangle BDS, so I just used the Pythagorean formula. So the XYZ of sunrise is this, and this is for set. To acquire a working formula for the length of day between sunrise and sunset, I was going to need angle X. I already had two sides of right triangle ABR, but side BR looked a bit messy to work with, so I used side AB instead, which is the sum of sides AC and BC. Now that I had these two sides, I could find angle X. 
Adding 90 degrees to this gave me the angle for the half day, but here I've applied a trig identity, which does the same thing. Dividing this result by 15 degrees gave me the sun up hours for half the day, and doubling it, the hours for the whole day. Did I need to work any of this out? Not really. I could have just gotten GeoGebra to measure what I needed from the initial construction, but I found it all to be a useful exercise to do anyway. So that's it for this one. If you liked it then please hit the thumbs up for me and do leave me a comment down below. Let me know if you disagree with any of it or if you found it helpful. So yeah, thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you later. Whatever, blah blah blah.